Hello everyone. The topic for discussion today is cleft lip and cleft palate. Cleft lip and cleft palate are one of the most common occurring congenital uh, deformities with which children are usually born. They are actually not life threatening until and unless they are complicated by some other syndromes which usually have systemic complications. The incidence of this cleft lip and palate is different among different races. It is actually one in every 600 to 1000 live births. Before going in detail about cleft lip and palate, let us first have a brief introduction on embryology. At about fourth week of intrauterine life, a prominent bulge is seen on the ventral aspect of the developing embryo. This is nothing but the developing forebrain. Below the brain, a small depression in the form of a shallow depression is seen, which is called a stomodium. Stomodium is nothing but the future mouth. The floor of the stomodium is provided by means of buccopharyngeal membrane. This membrane separates the oral cavity from the foregut. At about fourth week of intrauterine life itself, six prominent bulges appear on the area where the future head and neck will develop. But the fifth, as soon as it is formed, disappears. It is rudimentary and only five pharyngeal arches remains. The first pharyngeal arch is called as the mandibular arch and it plays a very important role in the development of nasomaxillary region. Each of these arches gives rise to various parts of the body including muscles, uh, bones, tissues, etc. The, uh, the mesoderm covering the uh, uh, developing foregrain shows a downward projection which is nothing but called as frontonasal process. In this diagram we can see frontonasal process. At this stage the stomodium is covered superiorly by means of frontonasal process and inferiorly by the mandibular arch. The mandibular arch produces a small bud from its dorsal end called as the maxillary process. This maxillary process grows ventromediocranial to the main part of the mandibular arch which is now called as the mandibular process. At this stage, the stomodium is covered superiorly by frontonasal process, laterally by the maxillary process and inferiorly by the mandibular process. The two mandibular process of either side starts growing towards each other and ultimately fuses and results in the formation of the lower jaw and the lower lip. The ectoderm overlying the frontonasal process shows two bilateral localized thickenings. This is nothing but called as nasal placodes. These placodes, as soon as they form, sink and result in the formation of nasal pits. Formation of this nasal pit divides the frontonasal process into median nasal process and the lateral nasal process. Now, as the two maxillary process from either side starts growing towards each other, the frontonasal process becomes narrow and ultimately the median nasal process fuses with that of the maxillary process, and this junction is called uh, results in the or marks nasolacrimal duct. Here we can see in the diagram how it is fusion of median nasal process with that of the maxillary process and this fusion is referred to as nasolacrimal duct. Now let us know how the development of palate takes place. Palate is actually developed by the contribution of three things. First is the frontonasal process, second maxillary process and the palatal shell is given off from the maxillary process. There are actually two parts on the palate. Primary palate, secondary palate. So the thing which is produced from the frontonasal process contributes to the primary palate and secondary palate is formed by the contribution of palatal shells which are given off from the maxillary process. Hence we can see in this diagram primary palate and the remaining is called as the secondary palate. The palatal shells which are produced by the maxillary process starts grow medially towards each other. But as they start grow medially towards each other, their growth is prevented by the presence of tongue and because of the presence of tongue they start to grow in a vertically downward direction. But sometimes at around seven and a half weeks of intrauterine life, there is sudden change in the growth of these palatal shells. Instead of going, growing vertically downwards, now they again start to grow medially towards each other. And this sudden change in transformation actually occurs within some hours. And there are a number of studies which has been put forward which could be responsible for occurrence, occurrence of these changes. Uh, many authors have said that it occurs because of certain changes in the biochemical and the physical consistency of the tissue. Few authors say that no, there is sudden change in the blood circulation or the blood supply. Few says that there is some intrinsic shell force which causes this sudden change. And one another thought is that because uh, of the movement of the embryonic head, initially it rests like this on the chest. Because of the movement of the head against the chest prominence, the mouth opens up and the tongue gets lower down. As soon as the tongue gets lower down, the parietal shifts now start going medially towards each other. By about uh, seven and a half to eight weeks of intrauterine life, the parietal shelves are very close to each other. And finally, the epithelial cells between the two parietal sh shelves disintegrate and the cells of mesenchymal cells of both the parietal shelves intermingle with each other and finally fusion takes place. The fusion does not occur at a time in the entire palate, but it begins somewhere at the center and then it starts proceeding anteriorly and posteriorly. 
but the posterior most part of the palate remains unossified which nothing but develops into soft palate final complete ossification of the mid palatal suture takes place at about 12 to 12, uh, 12 to 14 years of age next coming to what is the etiology of cleft lip and cleft palate it means how cleft lip and palate actually occurs there are three main factors which can be considered as responsible for the occurrence of cleft lip and palate they can be heredity environment or it can be multifactorial heredity cleft lip and palate has a lot of uh, has a lot of chances uh, to get inherited from parents to children they can be transmitted both as recessive as well as dominant tribes environment there are certain agents or there are certain uh, conditions uh, which usually results in the occurrence of clefts in children uh, this are usually considered as teratogenes these agents are called as teratogenes and this phenomenon is called as teratogenesis uh, like uh, consumption of certain drugs or intake of certain drugs by mother during the time of pregnancy like dilantin sodium methotrexate these drugs are respond are considered as teratogenes and consumption of these drugs results in the occurrence of clefts in children and apart from the certain uh, diseases uh, diseases like metadermal rubella infection syphilis these are also considered certain teratogens which are responsible for occurrence of clefts in children multifactorial the proponents of this uh, multifactorial theory states that uh, the occurrence of cleft lip and palate is multifactorial they say that alone heredity or alone environment cannot play a role but both are responsible for causing clefts According to them, until and unless a person is genetically susceptible, environment alone cannot play a role in the occurrence of cleft lip and palate. Next, that, that, that was all about etiology. Now, what are the predisposing factors? Means, who are the people who are actually more prone for the occurrence or development of cleft? Predisposing factors are increased maternal age, racial, and the third is blood supply. First, increased maternal age. It's, it has been quite uh, observed that uh, women who usually conceive after 35 years of age group, there are more chances for those women uh, to give birth to the children who have usually cleft lip and palate. Apart from this race, Mongoloids are usually more commonly seen to suffer from clefts when compared to other races. And blood supply. During the embryonic development of the fetus, if there is deprived blood supply to the developing organs, particularly this nasomax area, it will definitely result in the occurrence of clefts. Next coming to classification. A number of authors have given some classifications so as to simplify the learning or the understanding of the clefts. Now, this classification was given in the year 1922 by Davies and Ritchie. According to them, they had divided the clefts of the lip and palate into three groups: group one, group two, and group three. Group one are all pre-alveolar clefts. That means all that is clefts of lip. It can be unilateral, bilateral, or median. Group two are all post-alveolar clefts. That means it doesn't involve alveolus. It can be clefts of hard palate and soft palate. Group 3 is complete clefts involving lip, even alveolus and even the hard palate and soft palate. It can be unilateral, bilateral or median. The next classification was given in the year 1931 by View. According to him, group 1 are the clefts of only soft palate. Group 2 are the clefts of soft palate and hard palate. Group 3 are clefts of soft palate, hard palate, alveolus, lip, but unilateral. Group 4 are clefts of soft palate, hard palate, alveolus, and even lip, but bilateral. Next, coming to Kernahan's strip Y classification, it was given in the year 1971. Now, they have actually uh, denoted the classification in a very simple way in the form of a Y, and they have taken incisive foramen as a landmark, and they have given numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Incisive foramen is taken as a landmark. 1 and 4 indicates clefts of the lip, 2 and 5 indicates or clefts of the alveolus, 3, 6 cleft of the heart palate anterior to incisive foramen, 7, 8 clefts of the heart palate posterior to the incisive foramen, and 9 are nothing but clefts of the soft palate. Lashel's classification. This is actually each word stands for the particular part. L for lip, A for alveolus, H for heart palate, S for soft palate. And depending upon the site of involvement, right side and left side, it is indicated. Now, this was all about etiology, predisposing factor, everything. Now, what are the problems with which the children who are born with clefts usually suffer? So, usually they suffer with dental problems, aesthetic problems, speech and hearing problems, and psychological problems. First, coming to dental problems, it is quite logical to understand that since cleft of the lip or the palate is present, teeth doesn't adapt at a proper age. The teeth either remains impacted, either ankylosed, or sometimes few children doesn't 
have teeth only anodontia if they develop or if the, if the teeth erupt also there will be very less number of teeth will be present that is nothing but called as hypodontia teeth if they are formed also they will be malformed teeth abnormal shaped teeth uh, the teeth usually doesn't have a sufficient amount of enamel. Enamel hypoplasia will be there. Frequent occurrence of the caries will be there in children. Few children will be born with teeth. They are nothing but called as natal teeth. And few children will develop teeth during their first month of life called as neonatal teeth. So this means the dental, the dental aspect of these teeth will be very much deteriorated. Next is aesthetic. Now because of the cleft of the lip, there will be severe disfigurement of the face. Hence aesthetics is usually compromised in these patients. Speech and hearing. This is also very important that usually the patients of cleft lip and parrot develop middle ear infections at a very early age. Now since the middle ear infection develops at a very early age, they usually lose the capacity of hearing. Since the capacity of hearing is lost, they cannot hear properly, the, hence they usually doesn't develop proper speech and uh, both speech as well as hearing is impaired. Psychology. Because of severe disfigurement of the face and because of lack of hearing and speech abilities, these children usually have a lot of, lot of psychological trauma. They are very poor in academics also and they usually doesn't mingle up uh, with others. Now next is how to manage a cleft lip and palate patient. Actually, management of cleft lip and palate is not uh, done by a single uh, specialty. It actually requires involvement of many specialties, multi-speciality treatment has to be done. Among them, one of the most uh, most commonly involved specialties is orthodontists, pedodontists, pediatricians, speech therapists, oral and maxillofacial surgeons, plastic surgeons, and many other specialties are involved. The management can be divided into four main stages: stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four. Stage one is from birth to 18 months. Stage two, 18 months to fifth year. Stage three is sixth year to eleventh year, and stage four is eleventh year to eighteenth year. Stage 1 that is birth to 18 months. Now this stage comprises of following things. First is a fabrication of a passive maxillary obturator. Second is pre-surgical orthopedics. Third is surgical repair of lip, cleft lip and fourth is surgical repair of cleft palate. Now we will see each and every step of it in detail. First coming to fabrication of a passive maxillary obturator. This passive maxillary obturator is an intraoral prosthetic device or the prosthetic appliance which helps to fill up this cleft. Now since because the cleft is present, the child suffers from a number of problems. The child is unable to swallow or suckle, usually have air choking problem. There is even uh, air intake, nasal resonance of voice. So this obturator acts as a ceiling or the false roof over the cleft and helps the child to properly suckle and even helps in aid in speech and also avoids nasal resonance of the voice. This passive obturator is uh, fabricated by using cold cured acrylic after properly blocking all the undercuts. For proper retention, clasps can also be incorporated into this obturator so that it can properly get retained inside, uh, inside the oral cavity. If further retention is required, then even wires can be incorporated into the acrylic and it can be properly contoured over the cheeks of the Baby, and with the help of micropolitism tapes, it can be properly placed on the cheeks. This is pre-latham device. Next is pre-surgical orthopedics. The pre-surgical orthopedics, the main aim of the pre-surgical orthopedics is to achieve a proper upper arch form which corresponds to the lower arch. Now, since I have already mentioned that in, the, in these patients of cleft lip and palate, there is deficient tissue of the cleft lip. And because there is also cleft of the palate, the pre-maxilla is usually protruded outside. Now the main aim of the orthodontist is to properly position this pre-maxilla at a very early stages of uh, treatment itself. So this can be achieved by, uh, by properly strapping this pre-maxilla uh, and uh, properly strapping across the pre-maxilla and application of the force directly either from the face bones or from the by using a form of the head cap. So when this is done, it usually helps in a number of ways. Uh, since the pre-maxilla is pushed back to its correct position, the size of the cleft is reduced to a very greater extent. Since the size of the cleft is reduced, it helps in proper feeding. It even helps in development of proper speech to the child. Also reassures the patient, patient, uh, patient's parent at a very early stage. Since the size of the cleft is reduced, the patients also get uh, very much uh, involved in the treatment. Next is surgical management of cleft lip. These are all under the first stages, so that is birth to 18 months. This is the third step of the first stage. That is surgical management of cleft lip. The surgical management of cleft lip, actually there are two schools. The early schools says that surgical management of cleft lip should be done as early as possible. 
within the 45 days of the birth why they say this is uh, according to them they says that uh, the immune system of a newborn child is very good so uh, it has to be done as early as possible but the late school says that it should be delayed till the direction of dentition and they say that uh, why it should be delayed is sufficient amount of tissue must be present for proper uh, for properly positioning of the lip for giving proper sutures and all However, Millard gave rule of 10. According to Millard's rule of 10, he says that the child should not be less than 10 weeks of age, weight should not be less than 10 pounds, and hemoglobin should be 10 gram percentage. Now, there are a number of procedures given for the management of surgical management of cleft lip. Surgical management of unilateral cleft lip can be done by either of the methods. It can be Millard's rotation advancement flap or Tennyson Rendon triangular flap or bilateral lip. The bilateral uh, Surgical management of bilateral cleft lip can be done by either single step procedure or double step procedure. For double step procedure, any of the above mentioned procedure, what I have already said, can be used. But for single step, usually view three procedure is most commonly used. Now the procedure is, first markings are made on the surface of the lip according to whatever procedure we are planning, uh, whatever procedure we are planning to do. After that, uh, adrenaline uh, solution is injected and then Full thickness incision is made according to the markings um, and then uh, uh, suturing, suturing is given in three layers that is mucus layer, muscle layer and nasal layer. Care must be taken that copets bow should be horizontal and there should be no vermilion notching of the lip or else this will result in occurrence, this will result in shrinkage of the tissue and this will affect aesthetics. Uh, next is surgical management of cleft palate. Surgical management of cleft palate is usually attempted ideally at 12 to 24 months of age. If this is done very early, this will result in retardation of the maxillary growth. If it is delayed very prolonged, then what it will cause is it will affect the speech. So ideally it should be done at 12 to 24 months of age. And the most commonly used procedure is VY pushback palatoplasty. The procedure here is first infiltration of the palate is done. Full thickness mucopyrosal flaps are elevated from both the palatal shelves and then repair is done in three layers that is nasal layer, muscle layer and oral layer and hook of the hamulus have to be fractured to relieve the tension at the suture line. Next this was all about stage 1. Stage 1 comprises of four steps. First fabrication of passive maxillary obturator, pre-surgical orthopedics, surgical management of cleft lip, surgical management of cleft palate. First stage over. Next is stage 2 that is 18 months to 5th year. This is the deciduous dentition period. This consists of only adjustments in the internal obturator. We have to check for the eruption pattern of the primary teeth. Any caries is occurring, we have to pro protect the teeth and we have to uh, do fillings required. Uh, then and there, oral hygiene instructions should be given and restorations have to be done if required. Stage 3, that is the 6th year to 11th year of life, is the mixed dentition period. Here, correction of any anterior cross bites if they are developing, correction of any posterior cross bites have to be done. Because cross bites are uh, that type of malocclusion which if doesn't, if it's not corrected at an early stage, it will further deteriorate. So it has to be corrected as soon as it is recognized. Anterior cross bites can simply be corrected by giving removable appliances with Z springs and all. Posterior cross bites can be corrected by giving quarterlicks or if required expansion screws can also be incorporated and uh, cross bites have to be corrected. The last stage that is the stage 4 that is 12 to 18 years. This is the permanent dentition stage and it requires fixed orthodontic therapy has to be done. Crowding, spacing, rotations, any mal relationship, uh, intra or inter arch mal relationships have to be corrected. If required, surgical plan has to be made. Uh, actually, proper diagnosis and proper evaluation of the case in all the three planes of space, that is sagittal, transverse and vertical have to be done. And if any requirement of the surgery is done, it has to be planned and done at this stage of treatment. This was all about cleft lip and palate. Thank you.